Thanks everybody for coming. Thanks for doing it. At first, my slide title was called personal finance. And I was like, that's so boring. <laughs> and like, it's kind of a negative connotation, I feel like. And so I put creating wealth and choice. And, and kind of out throughout all of this, it's like, what can we do to create that wealth for us? And then that gives you the ability to choose, do I want to spend on vacation? Like, do I have enough for retirement? Like it, it gives you the choice. So uh, usually in these like personal development sessions, the person starts out with their credentials. Um, I have no hard credentials. <laughs> so, uh, just going into that, have that expectation. But uh, hopefully the content, content speaks for itself. Uh, I took a class in high school on personal finance. I did, took two at BYU because I loved it so much. I've been through two of Dave Ramsey's programs and it's just kind of part of my job uh, translates a little bit over to personal finance and then my life and passion. Um, it's a fun topic for me. So uh, those are my credentials. How much wealth do you have? <laughs> uh, Fair question. <laughs> You can answer toward the end. <laughs> I have a slide on. <laughs> so in personal finance, oftentimes you get so overwhelmed. Um, don't let the entire staircase overwhelm you. Just focus on the first step. A lot of times you'll see you'll see the whole thing you have to do, and you're like, oh my gosh, I need this much money by retirement, and you just kind of get overwhelmed. You're like, well, let's just pray that like close makes it right. <laughs> Somehow my equity is worth so bad much. Strategy. So, <laughs> what? Is that a bad strategy? Uh, yes. I mean, not on close. Close is great. It's going to make it, but I always have a backup plan. Um, so I started off with the most important. This To me, this is like the main takeaway of this whole session and of all my studying of personal finance is this one thing. If, if we only get through this, I'd be pretty happy because I feel like it's the, the best the thing that I've come across. And so just like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Where it's like, okay, you got to do this. And then, and then you can start actualizing and, and doing stuff higher up. I've kind of created the same structure. So as far as like, hey, where am I at on this? And like, where, what step do I need to do next? The first step is have a thousand dollars in emergency fund. Um, and I say cash, small bills. Um, you know, sometimes I, I've been in a situation where uh, the whole neighborhood's out and the grocery store will only take cash. And so it's nice not to have like hundred dollar bills and stuff like that. So um, always have that in case of emergency. The next would be to create a one month reserve of essential items, um, you know, food, toiletries, water. Once again, you lose your job. Uh, you have those things where you're like, okay, I'm not going to worry about, I'm not going to have to worry about eating. Right, like we've got that down. I, I, there's in case I made a mistake with my money, I still have food that I can like feed, feed myself. Right. Um, number three, get adequate insurance. So, on your car insurance, I would get a thousand dollar deductible. Um, if you're doing life insurance and you have people that rely on you, get life insurance. You're mandated by law to get car insurance, but a lot of people don't have car insurance. Get car insurance, those types of things protect you. Uh, on life insurance, get uh, term life, not whole life. Um, most people agree with me, I think, on that one, but I can go into it later. The four steps, put enough in your 401k to get the company match, right? It's a 50% guaranteed rate of return that you can't put that into any investment and get a guaranteed 50%. So do that for sure, right? The, the, put in 2000 to get the 1000 then the next step, if you've done all those, pay off your debt with the debt snowball. You can Google debt snowball. It's a great, um, it's a great system to get your, your debt paid off. Um, number six is get three months of living expenses in bank, in, in the bank, in your bank account, and three months in a Roth IRA slash investment. And a lot of times they'll say, hey, three to six months, but like, I don't like tying up that much money in a, in a savings account that's going to earn you 0.5% interest. And so I do say like, all right, have the three months that you know, like it's there, maybe even create a separate bank account so you don't see it. It's nice not to be logging and be like, oh, we actually have $15,000. Like maybe we should buy that car. You know, we'll, we'll build it back up, right? Have it separate so where it's like, I don't see it. I don't touch it. 
And then I'll get to this a little bit later, um, but in investments, you can pull out your money whenever. And same with the Roth, you can pull out your contributions from a Roth penalty free and tax free. Uh, so that's always a good option. And then it's also growing for you. Seven, invest 15 to 20% of your gross income. Um, if you want to retire, that's, that's probably what you're going to have to do. So unless you want to adjust your retirement uh, living situation. But. Uh, eight, college funding for your children. Um, there's two things that grow higher than the rate of inflation constantly, uh, or wage inflation that is, and that's healthcare and school costs. And it's just a huge problem. So, and then nine is building, uh, just build wealth, pay off house and give back. So kind of the whole self-actualization Maslow's. But any, any thoughts or questions on this or Stevens is digesting it. Oh, that's, it's just a tax advantage plan to where you can save your, your children's uh, education and not have to pay tax. When you say pay off debt with the debt snowball, I assume that that excludes the mortgage, right? Yeah, that excludes Other your debts. mortgage. Uh, if you're looking at a pure financial standpoint, some people say you should have a mortgage until you die, uh, because you you know usually mortgages you can get into the three to five percent range, and you can uh, get a return on your investment in the eight percent range. So it, it makes uh, it makes sense even until you die. My my view is just like time it for around when you're 65. It's just nice to have the peace of mind that you don't hold anything on your house. So. Oh, um, yeah. <clears throat> Ask you for a friend, but uh, <laughs> all of this is, um, is under the expectation that you have expendable income, meaning you can pay uh, $1,000, you can uh, <clears throat> pay off debt. Um, I've got this friend who has a spouse that uh, spends a lot of money <laughs> making it so that pretty much every single month they're breaking even. Have you found in your, um, in your experience some good tactful ways I could share with my friend to uh, discuss this with his spouse? Yeah, I do later. Okay, great. Coming up here in a little set. I should have invited that. I should have, huh? Yeah. <laughs> the, the 401k to get the company match and then the 15 20% invested uh, like if you're investing at 15 to 20 percent is it better to just do that in regular investments or in an investment um i'll get to that too so i yeah good questions sorry i jumped i jumped to like an overall summary right at the beginning because i feel like it's most important but yeah i, I see a lot of uh, like life insurance like when you grab a term and stuff like that but what I've experienced with life insurance is that a lot of life insurance policies lapse. And it's like, uh, what, how are you building on like gathering disability insurance? It's more likely to be my compensation value than, than the other, rather than the way we're paying for it. Yeah, my, my first thought is like, the most important is if you pass away, like um, you want to cover that uh, problem first. And it's, it's less expensive than getting disability insurance. Um, life insurance, you get like a 30 year term policy. The problem is if you go to get life insurance in 20 years, your rate's going to go way up. It goes up by age basically. And so if you can lock in your rate now, um, uh, and be like, all right, I'm going to get a million dollar life insurance policy and it's going to cost me 700 bucks a year, like for the, for the next 30 years. The nice thing is your, your wages are going to grow inflation and all that, but that stays at 700 bucks. Um, and so not only do you have inflation working against you, if you go get the term in 20 years, but also, uh, your age goes against you. Um, and then disability, usually you have that through work. So my thought is like, I, I feel like most companies have long-term disability insurance. Um, and so I don't really need that personally, but. Do you happen to know if there's a difference in life insurance versus disability insurance in the way that you're able to leverage it for further investing in the future? Because I know a lot of people utilize uh, health insurance for that in different ways. So that's whole life insurance. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. no, you're good. And it's, it's uh, they pitch it as like, hey, this is life insurance and an investment. What it really is, it's, it's okay life insurance and crappy investment. Right. 
about you. <laughs> like, you to me, yeah, it, and, and like, I, I don't recommend it. Yeah, and I would say most people don't. Um, and, and it's funny, because you'll, you'll get pitched by financial advisors, and you're like, oh, this is a financial advisor. And like, oh my gosh, term life insurance is so good. And like, the nice thing is it's paying toward the policy, but if you don't use it, it's still yours. And that's like some compelling stuff. Most of those people are compensated on selling life insurance or whole life insurance, right? They get so much more money and it's ongoing for them. And so you gotta be careful. I feel like there's really growing up, you're like, oh, doctors don't know it, know everything. Um, personal or personal advisor, financial advisors don't know everything. Um, so anyways, like there's some really bad advisors out there. Okay, um, so most of you probably know this, but it's always interesting to see this. If you had a million bucks and you just left it in your bank account, it's gonna decrease in value over time. I mean, it's still a million bucks, but like at the end of 50 years, you're gonna have uh, 224,000, right? So just keeping your money in a bank account is, is the worst, right? You can't just do that, but like, inflation is gonna hurt it. Um, Basically, a million dollar house here is you're not going to be able to afford it, but the same one in 50 years. Um, and then the next powerful thing with, with personal finances is compound interest. Um, Albert Einstein said compounding is the eighth wonder of the world and mankind's greatest invention because it allows for the re reliable, systematic accumulation of wealth. And what compound interest is, is that you know, you put in a hundred bucks, you get a 10% return. Then, then the next year you have 110 and it gets a 10% return. And so you get 11 bucks and it just keeps growing and growing and growing. And so there's more power for us as early as you can to put the money away because then it just grows on itself. Uh, and I think uh, if you don't totally understand this principle, it's definitely worth like YouTubing because it's, it's so powerful. So, I mean, and part of that is like, if you were to invest $77 per month in something um, and get an 8% yearly return, which is very realistic for 50 years, then you have your million dollars um, right there. It's just $77 a month, right? Because it just keeps adding on each other and compounding. Um, two parts of the equation in my mind, um, is income and, and exp income minus expenses equals wealth, right? And on income, every dollar, we live in a, a marginal tax rate. So every additional dollar you make, it's taxed at a higher amount. And so we could focus on income and everything, but even, even focusing on that, you're only going to get 75 cents worth of your effort. Um, and studies show that you just spend more when you make more. I think the, the focus of the next part of this presentation is the expense side. There's more power. If you save a dollar, you actually get a dollar because um, there's no taxes that, to take it away from you. So the, to me, the focus is on expenses. Um, so we'll kind of get into the budgeting. Um, I didn't necessarily gear this around like the relationship with the spouse and like managing the spending. So hopefully the principles like hold together, but I'm sure there's probably like a whole nother thing. Uh, you've heard me say this, watch the pennies and the dollars will take care of themselves, Benjamin Franklin. Um, so from a budgeting software, like to be in the detail, these are some of the best. YNAB, uh, mm -hmm. Mint, Mint's free, uh, Good Budget, I think that's maybe free as well. Um, I think those are powerful if that's your jam, like it's super nice to be like, get a text that says, oh crap, I went over my like gas budget and like gives you like clues or whatever. And okay, I don't have any more in my restaurant budget to go out this week, right? So some of these are awesome. Some of them require so much work, right? Um, and so I've also kind of created my personal like budgeting and that's more of like a principle based budgeting. And kind of to answer your question, like <clears throat> the first thing is you get your income and then you pay yourself. Like most people have these flipped. Most people, it's like, all right, I'm going to spend on all that stuff. And then whatever's left over, I can do for savings. Um, what you do is you have your income on in-pay losses. You can set up five different bank accounts. Um, 
And so you could say like, hey, right off the bat, 20% of my income is going over here or into my 401k or whatever. Um, and so that when this comes down to it, um, your significant other, there's just no money to spend. Um, and it's a little tricky with credit card. I do, I do say like, use a credit card, but always pay it off. And if you get to the end of the month and you're like, you don't have any money to pay off the credit card, like that should put you like red warning lights, like, okay, I guess we're not eating for the next two weeks or, you know, like do something because you just went over, like, you can't do that. Like, do not spend or do not pay the 16% interest fee on a credit card. That is like the worst. Um, and so I've got a question for you. Yeah. So one of the things I've heard about credit cards and I'm interested to hear your opinion on is like people say, oh, I always use a credit card because of the 2% cash back or the miles right. or the points or whatever. I think that works for really disciplined people. Yeah. I think most of us will overspend if they use a credit card, even if they pay it off month after month. And those benefits basically are a wash because they're spending more anyway. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, Dave Ramsey says use like the envelope system, which is use cash. Um, some of the benefits of like a credit card is if you lose it and someone spends on it, you can just be like, oh, fraud and get that money back. If you lose cash, it's just gone. Um, uh, to me, I'm actually the opposite where I'm like, if I pay with cash for something, I'm like, hey, this is off the books. It's free. Like, <laughs> I'm, more, I'm more talking about like credit card versus debit card. Because oh. people don't use a lot of paper cash nowadays, right? Yeah. The I, debit card, you actually see it decreasing in your bank account, whereas credit card, it's like, oh, I got a $10,000 limit. I can just you know, so keep going. The right answer would probably be debit card. Uh, but I'm kind of a sucker for the credit card points as well. You could, what you could do, even if you spend a, uh, usually you pay it off monthly, right? You could actually set it up to pay it off uh, weekly and actually try to act as a debit card. You can also set up like auto pay. Um, so it just automatically takes it out. But like for me, I just use the end like you're talking about. And every single time a transaction comes through, it just like will automatically put it in a specific part of the budget. So even if you use your credit card, so you know but i do agree it's very behavioral and if a debit card just helps you like control it better and there's also some like i think in one of our uh uh the pitch videos at, at silicon slopes that we did for close i want to say there was some guy that pitched like a a pretty cool like software he's created for that but anyways um, so yeah, the 15 to 20%, once again, it's kind of a balancing act for me. It's like, okay, you know, take the 20% first fill up the thousand bucks. Once you fill that up, go fill up like the three, to three to six months of living expenses, and then start investing in your 401k. But I've also seen where it's like, you know what, maybe instead of doing the full 20%, let me put in like 10% into my retirement. And then the other 10% is going to work towards, um, the three to six months of living expenses, like building that up. Um, and then on top of that, like you gotta save for other stuff too. Like our, our, pay yourself first. So when Christmas comes around or like you are doing a remodel or you're needing a new car, like it's just there. And it's like, um, put, put five to 10%. And then once again, you're assessing everything else after that. You're like, all right, okay, these are my, this is the bucket I have. We have to make it work. And that's where maybe a debit card comes into play because you, you feel the pain when you're target and you swipe and it says denied. And you're like, okay, well, I can't do that. And yeah, I think personal finance is like one of the hardest disciplined things we have to do. Um, another general rule for budgeting or like your living expenses is live two years behind your income. Um, I like that general advice. So like, you know, when you first, you get your first job, you still live as a college student When you get your first promotion, you still live, uh, as an entry level person off that same salary. Right. Um, and so on and so forth. Right. Um, I I've kind of tried to keep that mentality, um, in my life. Lifestyle creep, um, 
you get a raise, you have more money, you spend more money, you run out of money, you work harder, you get a raise, you have more money. Like it's, it's been proven through data and studies. There's a great study in the millionaire next door um, where you just actually spend more money. That's what, that's where I'm talking about. Like you can't rely on be like, I'm just going to make more money. Like I've got a promotion coming up or like if I switch companies, like, there's so much more power and focus on the expense side of the equation uh, than the income side. Um, now, don't get me wrong, like you wanna make more money, but yeah. Can I add an edit? Um, between have more money and spend more money should be get, getting married. And that's all I'll say, I'm, I'm done, I'm done. Oh, so are you happy? I, I'm, happy. I'm, happy. I'm just saying, no. My wife was on the Zoom, I wouldn't be going home. <laughs> I could go into, you know, Nate Bagley type stuff that says like, what top, one of the top three problems of marriage is just like finances, right? And so it is exactly. like super tricky, to, <laughs> like it's all figured out. And, and that's where I hope this education, this like, hopefully aligns you where it's like, okay, yeah, look, I, we got to sit down and be like, look, we got to have 20% go away. And, and, you know, like some of these are really hard if you have been doing this. And so it's like, once again, start with the first step, be like, you know what, I'm going to save 10%. Like that's going to go away automatically. And that, that's going to be the start this year. Uh, yeah. Uh, I read, on this, I read an interesting statistic recently that, that uh, a third of people who make over 250000 split their paycheck. Yeah. So it just kind of paints that picture that yeah, a lot of people still. <laughs> yeah. Love it. Um, total cost of ownership. A lot of times we think, so on, on my job, um, it's like, Hey, we want to add a, a $60,000 salary head. And a lot of people like stop there. Right. It's like, okay, it's $60,000. Perfect. And in my, in my mind, I say, well, there's also a bonus of $5,000 close has to pay a personal, uh, has to pay tax of 7.65%. So we owe another 4,800. Uh, a family insurance costs 15,000. So close has to pay for that. We're going to pay their HSA. We're going to pay their 401k match. We're going to pay the small group lunches and Friday catered lunches. That's going to be hundred dollars for the year for somebody. We're going to pay for their Salesforce license and there's LinkedIn sales navigator and sales loft. And that's, that's 3000 bucks. I got to pay for their computer. Uh, need a, uh, if we, ex there should be some burden given for rent. Uh, to an individual because if we have to expand floors uh, and then other miscellaneous at the end of the day all of a sudden I have a 100k expense um, on a 60k salary right and that's how I plan it in the budget and I've seen this in my own life and in people's lives we don't we don't totally walk through the whole math equation the total cost of ownership for something so like uh, we spend the most on our house and transportation so those are great ones to focus on um, but moving from like a 2000 square foot house to a 3000 square foot house, especially in this market could easily be like a 200 K upgrade. Well, that's 17 K more a year. Um, and then another K a thousand for taxes because property taxes assessed on your square footage. And then another 500 K because you have to pay more insurance on that. And then you have to buy furniture because there's two more rooms that you have to purchase. So that's 5 K. And then your utilities, you're heating the house more. And we don't realize like sometimes this decision all of a sudden adds up not alone not, uh, and to mention like a 40k commission potentially to like the real estate agent and so um so it's nice to be aware of all the things same with like a new car all of a sudden it's like oh yeah i forgot the car is twenty six thousand, but i also have to pay 7.25 percent tax okay i'll just i'll just kind of finance that or something right and then you just run into this vicious cycle if you buy it and then if you buy a truck it's another like thousand dollars in gas potentially uh same with insurance registration goes up uh, i'm not saying don't do these things but it's just like be aware right like it's the worst when you're surprised at the end of the day you're like oh i i feel like we're running out of money quicker than usual right um and then I think there's a ton of power in these million dollar decisions. Like I told you about the $77. It's like, find those things in your life that are their daily habits, weekly habits, um, just smart decisions where you can be like, 
look, in general, I can stop this to add to my 15 to 20% to save for retirement. And so I listed some of them, like you should be very conscious about your house, um, what you can afford. I go in, next slide, I think I go into like uh, rules for determining how much you, you can afford for a house. Um, and there's trade-offs, right? Like there's some value to being closer to work and not having to live uh, in Vernal and commute or something like that. Uh, same with your car. I, I have another slide for car, so we'll kind of skip that. And, and I know it's kind of ridiculous, but honestly, if you do the math, if you save $1,400 a month, um, back to that one example, you could have 14 million, right? Now you're not probably going to do that. The money's going to have probably going to go somewhere else, but like, it's a, it's really good thought to go through. Um, I think people spend way too much on Comcast cable. I think there's way easier solutions. You can share YouTube. I think, I don't know about legally or ethically. But, you can share yeah. So ethically and legally. Bats. 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 Uh, groceries. I did a Costco analysis once. Uh, there's way more than that because you actually might spend more at Costco. But as far as price per item and discipline, if you can be disciplined, uh, you can save more like going to Costco or, or clipping coupons or eating popcorn and ramen. Like those, those fill you up. They're not that expensive. She like eating? Uh, daily habits, like if you always get that coffee, like from Starbucks, there's, you can save a lot of money there, uh, doing it here for free, right? We have coffee here for free or at home, same with lunch, uh, stop paying for one streaming service, just like rotate them. You know, I feel like all of a sudden I'd have like four streaming services that I'm paying for. It's like, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. Um, okay. So buying a house, uh, in the general personal finance world, this is the rule, the 2836 rule. Um, and I should say real quick, like if you're like, well, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go to Washington DC and work in investment banking, I think, or New York in investment banking. And like, should I buy a house or should I just rent? Usually the break even is two to five years. There's a lot of factors that go into it, but if you're only gonna be in a place for around two years and not keep the house, uh, you're paying too much in closing costs on the house. Uh, your initial uh, mortgage payments, almost like 98% of it is going to interest. And, and I know a lot of people are like, I'm just throwing away money in rent. It's like, no, you're not. You're actually, when you get a house and you don't stay there long, you're actually throwing away money in just interest too. It's like if you move and closing costs. So usually like take that into consideration. Um, and then on what you can afford, um, you take 28% 20 of your gross. And um, I know there's a, a big portion in Utah that have to pay a 10, not have to, get to pay a 10% contribution. <laughs> you wanna factor that in. But everything of your home, uh, your home mortgage payment should be less than the 28%. So how that works is like, let's say you make $100,000 you minus out your charitable contributions, you have $90,000 times by the 0.28, that equals 2,500 divided by 12, you can afford a $2,100 mortgage payment. Does that mean you should? No, not necessarily. Like to me, this is probably like the high end. Um, and then this, this equation that they use as well does the same thing, but then just adds on all other debt and says it should be below 36. Amanda? Sorry, what? $10,000 in that equation? Uh, it, so the general, um, oh, it's tithing. <laughs> <laughs> so the personal finance world, they, they don't factor that in. But I think in, if you're a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, like, that you should factor that in your equation. <laughs> uh, I did take two classes at BYU, so I do apologize some of that comes through. But, uh, and then from the total debt, it should be under 36. So same math, 36. Uh, so you can be like, all right, um, I can afford 2,100 bucks plus $600 of debt. Technically, should you? No, this is like, this is the ceiling, I would say. Hey, Questions or 
I understand this is a rule and that you didn't make it up, but um, I'm wondering if it would work better with, I mean, obviously if it was net monthly income instead of based on your gross income, do you think, I mean, that would just be a lower mortgage, right? Sorry. No, you're great. I mean, net, your taxes because, and because healthcare costs. Because if you're basing this off of gross monthly, that's before taxes. tax. For the most part, everyone's treated the same on tax. Okay. But yeah, I don't know. That's good. No, I mean, yeah, I didn't make this up. But right. right. I'm just wondering if that would be a bit, because you aren't subtracting anything from the amount you're paying. You're just subtracting from the amount that you're earning before you pay. Anything. Yeah. So that could be. Um, I think it's maybe net because four hundred one k potentially. Okay. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Gotcha. Good question. All right, like I said, the second biggest expense is buying a car. Um, and my advice and some other stuff I've researched is buy a car that's two, three years old. Most of the depreciation happens in the first two to three years on the car. And then you hit this sweet spot where you still have a good car that you're not gonna have to spend a ton on maintenance uh, and you, you have a depreciated car. Uh, never lease, please. Uh, and you don't, don't trade in usually, usually it doesn't make sense. First of all, I, the disclaimer on this slide is this current market has thrown some of this advice out the window currently, but it's usually 99% accurate. Um, and then I debated on this, but like, I didn't see a rule out there, but some people have the philosophy, like don't, if you can't buy your car, don't get it. Like don't get a car loan. Um, I found that personally hard in my life. And so, Kind of the rule I use is put 50% or more down on a car and maybe just try to avoid a car loan altogether. So. Um, uh, this is like, um, you, you mentioned Dave Ramsey multiple times. I feel like he mentioned this in his book, The Total Money Makeover. What are your thoughts on the Robert Kiyosaki method of using the money that you put down on a car on an investment that pays you dividends, for example, or real estate that pays you monthly income and using that income then to make the monthly car payment? Uh, that's for dad, poor dad or something. Right, right. I've read that book too. What are your um, thoughts on that versus the Dave Ramsey? You know, because if you uh, spend a big chunk of yeah. money on a car and it immediately depreciates, whereas if you invest it into a, like invest it, whether it's dividend or real estate, by the time the car is paid off, you're still getting that monthly payment. I think that's the idea. Yeah. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't, I, I don't know that I one super works. well, but like, I think it works. It yeah. sounds a little complicated. Yeah, I was going to say but, it might be over. I, I would yeah. say it probably depends on what point you're at in your financial journey. Like, if you need a car, you're not at the point where you're able to start investing in things that can later pay for a car in the future. Uh, and you're taking more of a date ramp to both the approach of buying what you're able to to finance the situation. That, right? When yeah. if you're looking at the rich dad, poor dad approach, it's more of, okay, how do I now start building wealth now that I've set down my day brands and mentality? That's kind of the way I would compare those. Well, and that's even on true. both of them, my argument is there's too much risk in a five year time period to like bet on the investment paying for your car. Right. If you do it over like 30 years, sure. Yeah. But like five years, even Dave Ramsey's approach, he's like, no, take the mortgage payment and put it in a, a investment i'm like ah, just just buy 50 percent of the car yeah because i mean it seems to go along with real estate you have vacancies and then you have a mortgage you can pay yeah. for that you can repair so yeah I, yeah I was just wondering what your thoughts were on the yeah on the age-old debate of the Ramsey versus Robert. um what's yeah. the reason for no trade -in? um so you only get the benefit of the tax so like if you buy a twenty five thousand dollar car and you trade it for fifteen thousand um you get the benefit of not having to pay $15,000 of sales tax. So at the 7.25%, I have seen mostly you could sell your car for 20,000. Like put in a little bit of effort to put on KSL and like sell it for $5,000 more instead of trying to just get the tax break. Uh, but yeah, um, I mean, they're doing most of the work for you. Usually, banks and car dealerships are usually like, have protected themselves and figured out a good way, right? Like, unless you know it's a lemon, but then that's unethical and that, but we're not talking ethics. So, <laughs> um, all right, investing section. We're, we're doing okay on time. Um, never invest in something you don't understand. 
Warren Buffett. That's pretty legit. Where's Austin? <laughs> Austin, do you understand crypto? Do you understand crypto? Austin understands crypto. Do you understand crypto? Just check his return this year. All right. Okay. I think that might my account. <laughs> um, the stock market on average. Uh, this I pulled this from uh, Motley Fool, um, but you'll see that it's going to 2021. Those have been great. We've had great years in the past. And so the average has been 14% for 30 years, 9.9, 50 years, 9.4. They generally say eight years if you take it. Yeah. If you were to take this last year, I bet it, these numbers dropped to 8% around there. That's average per year or that's average total? Average per year. So like if you put in 100 bucks, you should expect every year to get 8%. So you'd have 108 bucks next year, which you can invest. And then another 8% on that. So um, so how much do I need to invest? Um, I've talked about the millionaire next door. Um, almost everyone says 15 to 20% of your gross income, you should be investing into retirement. Um, you will probably need $2 million to $6 million. Um, go fill out a few calculator, uh, retirement calculators online. Um, and then Fidelity and most financial firms give you, gives you a salary multiple and it says okay if you're age 30 and you're making 100k you know multiply that by one you should have 100k saved in your retirement funds so i i have a i do my check-in and be like all right do i have enough from a 2x salary because i'm 35 in my retirement oh crap i'm not i need to like catch up and like maybe do 25 percent um and then so on and so forth and, and it's interesting i have salary growing at four percent because you know oftentimes you get inflation, merit, promotion increases and stuff. And it's kind of hard to fathom, but if, if you are 30 right now, I bet you will be making 427,000 by the time you're 67. Um, and that would say you need $4.3 million for retirement. So, so is this saying basically 35, I should have $240,000 for retirement? Yeah. If you make one hundred twenty-two thousand. If you make one hundred twenty-two thousand. Yeah. That's to maintain your lifestyle. Focus on the first step because I've done the same thing. When I first saw this, like a couple years ago, I was like, "Well, I'm not there." <laughs> Where you at now? <laughs> <laughs> no comment. Um, okay. So practical advice. Like a lot of times, I I feel like I've been talking principles and whatnot. Like, let's not make this more complicated than it needs to be, go invest in Vanguard or Fidelity and invest in these two funds or these two funds. Like, there, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there are so much studies. I'll actually, I have some later, I think. You have to have a disclaimer. Too. What? This does not constitute financial advice. Oh, sure. Yeah, this is not financial advice from a legal <laughs> standpoint. Yeah. So the total stock market index fund, that's going to earn you 8%. Like, I've, I've done the whole like play with fun money and like, and guess what? I got, I got the same return as the market. And I like put so much dang freaking effort into it. Um, the Robin Hood ticker is VTI for that. Um, it's diversified. Um, it's Vanguard has some of the lowest fees uh, being an index fund and being Vanguard. They're known for that. And then index funds are managed by computers and 72% of the time they perform better than their sister mutual fund. Mutual funds managed by humans uh, and they have higher fees. So just do like a total stock market index fund. Just whatever you're doing, make sure it's an index fund. And then- uh, Are you saying that 72% of the time they have perform them fees? Uh, I don't know that, I, I mean, I looked it up. But my guess, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's after right. fees. It might it's be right. after fees. I don't by, know. by definition, they beat they beat the market fifty percent of the time. They represent the average, right? Yeah. Yeah. So so half of fund managers are gonna beat it, half of fund managers are not gonna beat it. But then after fees, you're you're behind the eight ball. Yeah. So, uh, I think so. so. Yeah, from my understanding. Um, another is just put do a target retirement fund, twenty, you know, twenty fifty, twenty fifty five, whenever you're gonna retire. And the nice thing about this is the closer you get to retirement, you don't want as much risk. And so like there's a the security called bonds, which is way less risky. 
Um, and when you're close to retirement, this will just automatically rebalance your funds for you. Um, so for me personally, I like just have a balance. Like right now I have more in here than this one, um, but I'll eventually maybe even like transfer over. And then, yeah, same thing with Fidelity. Fidelity is rated really high uh, from an experience user standpoint and all the metrics and fees and it's great to work with, so. Uh, one reason, if you can avoid tax, it's so powerful, especially when you're considering like a 30 year time horizon. And so um, investment instruments and tax treatment, you know, you have your HSA qualified, anything that for medical expenses, it doesn't get tax going in, doesn't get tax going out. There's no withdrawal age or early withdrawal. Uh, for non-qualified expenses, it's basically treated as a 401k. And I should preface this that HSAs, you can, put, you can invest money into the market. You can invest into the Vanguard total stock market index fund. Uh, and then, yeah, traditional 401ks, it doesn't get tax going in, but it gets tax going out. Um, if you take it off, take it when you're 59 and a half or older. If you do it before, it's a 10% penalty and you have to pay the tax. Um, same with Roth 401k. And I'm going to send out this deck. To me, this is almost a presentation slash like uh, reference guide. Um, Roth gets tax going in. The nice thing about Roth IRA, like I said, any contribution can be withdrawn tax and penalty free. Um, and then the stock market, you have to pay tax going in and you basically have to pay tax going out on the capital gains. Um, well, uh, Asterix here is you want to do long-term capital gains and hold your securities for at least 12 months. Oh, are they right here? I think you're right. I might have copied that. Oh, it. Thanks. So once again, kind of that investment hierarchy then is like put it up in the 401k to get the company match, uh, max out your HSA like, cause there's certain limits and it's a really powerful tool. Uh, max out your Roth, then go to your, uh, max out your traditional or Roth 401k. I think that kind of answered, did you have that question earlier maybe? Kind of, so like going to the previous slide, read that I should have $240,000 yeah. put away for retirement. Is that just like, that's not necessarily like in a retirement account, just like- I would put it in a retirement account. Because because you have there the you get the benefit of avoiding taxes on one end or the other. Okay, so it could be any of those like yeah the Roth obviously the Roth IRA has been like yeah I feel like if you're if you're catching up or even just yearly it's like all right I'm definitely gonna put the thousand dollars right or the two thousand to get the one thousand then I'm gonna do the HSA and max that out then I'm gonna fill out a Roth because I can take out my contributions if I need to and then I'm gonna go to the four hundred one k. Once again, I guess, I guess my question is like, I'm, I'm doing the company match, but like, should I be doing the 15% in the companies provided like for like, no, do that, do that in your Roth, probably like go, go open a Roth IRA. Well, you can only do like 6,000. Oh so like, yeah. Once you fill up that bucket, then go back to the company. This, you can only get a 401k through a company. So yeah, that these are kind of the same. Sorry. Okay. Tim curated content. Why do you guys not borrow the market? Um, I've seen people. Uh, so I think it's it it's it has a feeling more of gambling to me than actual investing. Like even with like puts and calls. Now I'm like uh, Stevens would probably like argue against me, and, and it's something I don't understand, so I don't invest in it honestly. Um, but it seems a little more like gambling, like in Robin Hood, gambling. yeah, like, Robin Hood is like, Hey, you have 30 K, but we'll let you invest 90. And you're like, Oh, this, what? Okay. Say the same thing for more steady stuff. Like, let's say you're investing in Vanguard and that average was 8% return, but your cost to borrow and margin is 5%. Then you're investing free money for three. Oh, so yeah, I think I know what you mean. I mean, like technically that's what. I don't mean this necessarily like with a house. Like if you can pay off your house, I'm like, don't pay off your house. Keep the 300K in an investment account instead. Uh, 
to me, I'm talking about like on these apps, like a new popular thing is like, hey, you can do margin where they just give you money. Yes. And yeah. So, sorry. I, I have an opinion on this, so I'm just gonna have to share. Yeah. The problem with the problem with investing on margin, because I've done this and I've gotten burned hard, um, is the, it's the duration of the investment, right? The reason it makes sense to not pay off a house is because the duration of your investment is like 20, 30 years yeah. if you're investing in retirement hunter or, or or buying a house. The problem with borrowing on margin is that you have a short-term loan, but you're buying it, but you're buying inherently long-term investments uh, like stocks. So the problem is if the value of your investments goes down in the short term, the value of your, like the, the amount of money that you owe on your loan is going to continue to go up and then you're going to get margin calls, like, and then you're going to be, a, you're going to be required to post more, colla more collateral and it become, it can become a vicious cycle where you can get really over leveraged really fast. Yeah. And the same thing can happen with options trading. So <laughs> it's just like, Unless you're a sophisticated investor, which I don't consider myself sophisticated I don't know enough if to say this. this, like people should probably only trade on margin unless they're if they're a professional investor and they're watching the market constantly. There's some people that say to trade on margin, you have to like uh, do a test and like pass. Oh, did you have something? I just wanted to add my voice to my soul brother here. I think <laughs> margin called to death in the last 12 months and not only do you get margin called when there's a dip in the market and they automatically sell your shares and take your money but um the interest rate on what you owe on the margin also goes up so if your investment that you put the margin in goes below your buy-in point and you're holding waiting for it to come back getting margin called while you're holding and then they increase the amount that you owe the interest rate on the margin that you're borrowing so now your money's tied up you're at a loss you're getting margin called and you owe more month after month it started out on Robinhood at two point five percent interest, and now it's at six percent. I think. Yeah. It's, and so, anyway, it's a yeah, it's, it's a nasty it downward. Seems spiral. appetizing, but I would just say for the other side of that yeah. argument, like I do agree with not getting too deep with stuff that you don't understand. But if there are more stable stocks that you're looking at, in my opinion, it's really smart to invest using margin. Maybe not on as much calls as ones that are a little bit more risky, but if you're investing in something that's more stable and you are investing even at a 6% interest rate, but you're averaging a 10% return, you're literally going to pay zero dollars to get a 4% return. Yeah, there's but just a lot of risk. You're trading in a 6% money percentage. Yeah. Austin? Um, obviously not financial advice, do your research, right? But I think. One of the biggest things, I love this conversation. I think one of the coolest things or opportunities we have here at Close is we work with a lot of public companies. Both in Stone Cold Open Europe and Las Vegas, right? That's the side of trading. But like, you learn about some pretty cool companies, yeah. right? And you can start doing your own research on these. And as you're investing, can you look at the companies that, one, have signs of like really good potential growth, two, have really healthy employee accounts. You watch them on LinkedIn. There's a lot of things that you can do that help to get ton of time like you said, Ben, or you know, like Robin Hood, you're looking at investing all day. You can find really, really good companies that you believe they have a shot at growing. That's where I would say allocate the majority of your, your money is whether it be stocks, the S&P 500. Yeah. Makes it. So on kind of some of that like fun money or like I'm going to do my own analysis, I, I say zero to 10%. I'm fine if you have it higher, but choose a percentage because what you'll say is like, oh man, I made so much money on Tesla and it's 20% of my portfolio. Like I'm going to switch another 20% over because I don't make so much money. And then all of a sudden that 40% goes down, like dies, right? So um, yeah. But I would say like choose a percentage and try to stick to it as well. And my advice would be like 10% on some of those things. But um, all right, I think I, I'll go through this one really fast. HSAs are crazy powerful. Um, we're probably gonna live until we're 80 to 90. Um, it keeps going up. I did a little bit of research when I was doing this. Um, right now, people are saying you need like 300K in healthcare costs. Um, and even if you don't, once again, you can just treat it like a traditional 401k. So like, I would say totally max out your HSA. Um, some strategies that are, that I would use is like, uh, don't, don't spend any money 
with your HSA until you have enough that you can start investing, which I think is a thousand bucks in health equity. Another thought is actually don't spend, I mean, they say, hey, spend it on medical expenses. And I'm like, no, just actually don't. Just use it for an investment account. Like get a hundred thousand dollars in there and then maybe start using it for medical. Or known as the, the HSA loophole, pay with a normal credit card, get the points, let your HSA grow, dollars grow in the investment account, growing at 8%. And then a hundred years later, reimburse yourself for the past hundred years of expenses. Um, you can do that too. I had a buddy that did it, had a two-year timer. He would do it every, uh, reimburse every two years later. Do you have to keep like all of your receipts? Do you yeah. Have... Uh, yeah. For a hundred years. <laughs> Well, so if you get audited, you so you should though, but yeah, you'd have to be pretty organized. That's why he only did two years. But speaking of, I, I know you're probably wrapping this up, but um, you've said multiple times this presentation ethically. On the next presentation you give us, can you give us an unethical treatment <laughs> of how to find, how to invest our finances? And uh, there's not a ton of ways, but yeah, start I, a Slack channel maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, a lot of people ask, like, is Roth better? Is traditional better? It actually doesn't matter. And I think you should have both in retirement. I walked through the math. Like, if, if you're in the same tax bracket, and I, I don't think anyone knows if they're going to be in a lower or high tax bracket when they retire. My thought is, if a certain political party is in, uh, you know, has more control, like taxes might go up or, you know, whatever. And, and, and in that case, I'll pull from my uh roth you know but vice versa if like all of a sudden there's some taxes are higher for eight years it's, i think it's nice to have both it doesn't matter if the tax rate is the same of when you put it in or pull it out um yeah most people have lower income in retirement um i don't know probably because you're not paying for like house stuff uh Everybody. oh income well isn't it your income's when you pull it out, right? Isn't it every time you withdraw funds, it's income. So my thought is at 65, when you're used to pulling that, when you're used to having uh, $300,000 or whatever it was, I, I think your lifestyle is not going to change too much and you're still going to pull that out and you're going to have to pay taxes on anything you pull out, which is income. So, but yeah, I don't know. It's something to look into. Um, Constantly invest, don't try to catch the bottom. I think I have like three more slides, uh, three more minutes. Um, they did this study, even if you had perfect timing or bad timing, it still basically averaged out to just like constantly investing. Um, like if you had, if you had $10,000 right now, you can either just go invest it, and you'll probably, you'll do great. Or you can invest $1,000 a month and do some dollar cost averaging. But I don't know. There's, I, I would say there's a lot of risk to just trying to do bad timing, a lot of like unnecessary burden on yourself emotionally. Um, time in the market beats timing the market. Um, Chairman Keith Banks. Um, for those that do charitable donations, there's huge tax advantages to donating to a charitable organization via stock. Um, I have this as a reference for you. But basically, you could avoid the long-term capital gains by just uh, sending it over. Super common to do. Super easy. So um, some of the things here. Uh, for those, like, or for all of us trying to get good credit score, some of the big things is your credit utilization ratio. So if you have 100K of credit card credit, only spend up to 20K of that per month, or, you know. Uh, or yeah, 10,000, 2,000, right? Um, they want to see that you're not looking desperate and using all your credit. Um, have a credit history of making all your payments, pay off your credit card in full every month. Um, have two to four credit cards. They want to see that like you have enough trust and that helps your utilization ratio. Um, and then they say have a car loan um, or like a furniture loan um, just to show your credit worthiness on like a collateral loan. Um, and then limit your credit inquiries. If you're like 
having everyone pull your credit because you're seeing if you can get more, they see that as desperate and will lower your credit score. So um, once again, there's a lot. Don't let the entire staircase overwhelm you. Just focus on the first step. Some of these ratios, it's like, there's no way I'm ever going to get there. Choose, choose 5%. Like, just choose a plan. Like, just be like, for 2023, I'm going to save 5% into a 401k. Um, like, start small, start on the first step. Uh, the rest of this, I have an appendix. It's my, uh, some of my favorite books on personal finance. Um, in Utah, uh, you can do a holographic will, just meaning written in your own hand and you don't have to pay $2,000 to a lawyer. This is the template you can use. Um, you and your spouse go fill it out. It takes care of your assets, makes sure things don't get locked up in probate. Um, it's very helpful. You can keep it somewhere, let someone know it's there, it exists. Um, it's a good first step. Uh, there's a great parable of the fishermen, if you've heard this one, but um, you can read through it if you want. But Basically, with all of this, it's like you don't need to go chase wealth. We can focus on like living our lives and uh, being happy. Um, tax documents that you'll you'll want to keep track of throughout the full year. Um, this explains marginal tax rate. Uh, this is pretty interesting. This shows by generation where we're spending our money, um, and so you can see like oh, people in 1945 they're spending a ton more on healthcare. Uh, but as, as it goes down, like Generation Z is spending less. Um, it might help you prioritize where you should like put some of your focus. Uh, and then this is my Costco versus Smith's analysis. But, and then uh, itemize versus standard. What goes into itemize versus standard deduction? Um, I also have some like thoughts on how you can game this by moving your charitable donations just every other year. Um, but anyways. Uh, that is it. We're at 501. Thanks. Any, any questions that would be good for the group real quick, do you think? Are you going to send this out? I'll send this deck out. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming.